Welcome to Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God podcast, an in-depth study of the Word of God. The program's name is from Romans 12, 2, which says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. If you are new to the program, welcome. And if you're a regular listener, welcome back to Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God podcast, where we are endeavoring to take a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study of the Word of God, which can only be found in the Bible. Specifically, we are wrapping up the book of John out of the New Testament. We will start in this episode, the final chapter out of the Gospel of John, which is chapter 21. And to recap thus far what has occurred leading up to chapter 21, we've looked at over the past episodes that our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ has offered himself as a perfect sacrifice, sinless, godly sacrifice for the sins of mankind. That's my sins. That's your sins. He went on that cross willingly to die for my and your sins. We also looked at not only did he die, but on the third day, he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father God raised Jesus Christ from the dead because he was and is sinless. And he rose with righteousness and power over heaven and earth. And because of his righteousness, that those who believe in him as Lord and Savior, his righteousness, Jesus' righteousness is impugned or credited to believers So there's nothing we can do. There's no works that we can do to replace what Jesus Christ did on that cross in his resurrection. The righteousness that we often try to work for, not doing this and doing that, can never overcome or replace what Jesus did for us. We can't do it. Only thing we can do is believe that Jesus did it for us. And that belief makes us right with God because not of anything that we have done, but because what Jesus has done, taking our place, dying for us, being resurrected in righteousness. He did all that for me and for you. And only thing you have to do is to believe that he did it and confess it. So we looked at that. And the last episode, we also looked at after his resurrection, he appeared to Mary Magdalene and some other women. He appeared to his disciples. They were locked away in fear of their own lives by uh, the Jewish, fearing that the Jewish leaders may also kill them. And Jesus miraculously appeared out of nowhere. And he had to say, peace be with you. Because I'm sure they were scared to see the resurrected Christ and his glorified body just appearing out of nowhere. And we also looked at that Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, which is representative of what he did on the cross, what what will enable believers to receive the Holy Spirit, to be indwelled with the Holy Spirit and have eternal life, to be made a new spiritual creature and have eternal life with our God. And so we saw that and and we lastly looked in last and we lastly looked in chapter 20 of the book of John, where John, the writer of this book, one of the original disciples of Jesus, said that many, many miraculous things that Jesus did to prove that he was God, to fulfill the scriptures, because the Jewish scriptures had predicted and prophesied the things that Jesus would have done, that Jesus would come as the Messiah and do all the things that he would do. So. Those who studied the Hebrew Bible, what we would call, the Christians would call the Old Testament, should have known, specifically these Jewish leaders, these Pharisees, the people who had studied and read and taught the Jewish Bible, or what they would call, what we'll call the Old Testament, 
They should have known about Jesus. So the Jewish scriptures had predicted Jesus. And so John tells us as he wrapped up chapter 20 that many things that Jesus did, but he focused on particular miracles in his book. And he told us what the purpose of his book, that those who read it may believe that Jesus was the son of God and that he died for their sins and that they may be saved. And that purpose of the book of John still stands today. And it still tells us today, over 2,000 years later, that Jesus is the Son of God, that He was perfect, sinless. He did many miracles to prove that who He was, who He is. And He died on a cross for me and you, for my sins and for your sins, not for His sins. He was sinless. He was not guilty. We were guilty. He took our place. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again and he's alive today at the right hand of the Father. And one day he's physically coming back to this earth. He's coming back. He's coming back. He said he's coming back and he's coming back. And so we're going to pick up in chapter 21 where he continue to meet with his disciples. And so as we typically do, we're going to read today verses 1 through 17 out of chapter 21 in the book of John. And we're going to read all of them, verses 1 through 17, and then we'll come back and we will break them down individually. So if you have not already done so, I would request that you open your Bible or your Bible app. And join me in reading the word of God. It is God. Think about this. God, the creator of the universe, has left us with his word. And here in particular in America, we often neglect and don't read it. Where in other countries, they could be killed for just having the Bible, let alone reading it. But having the Bible, having possession of it could lead to their death. And here in America, where we have freedom of religion and we have the word of God in the Bible readily available and yet we neglect to read it we have his word we should read it we should study it and matter of fact he commands us to read and study his word and as a part and if you're doing that that's a part of obeying God's command to read and study his word so if you haven't haven't been following along in your Bible I would encourage you to do so when you can. I know sometimes you may be listening to this as you're driving or working out or at work or wherever the situation may be. and you, It may not be a opportune time to actually open the Bible or open your Bible app and read alone. But I would encourage you when you can, read God's word. It is powerful. It's alive according to God's word. His word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it is. It's powerful. And it's life changing. And so if you have not already done so, join me in turning to chapter 21 of the book of John or the gospel of John found in the New Testament of the Bible. And it's verse one says later, Jesus appeared to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellas, Have you caught any fish? No, they replied. So he then said, throw out your net on the right hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Verse seven. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic for he had stripped for work, 
jumped into the water and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore for they were only about a hundred yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over charcoal fire and some bread. Verse 10. Bring some of your fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been risen from the dead. After the breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Finally, verse 17, a third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, in your son Jesus' mighty name, we thank you for this opportunity to acknowledge you, to praise you, to lift you up, to give you honor, to give you glory for being God. You alone are God. You're the living God, the true God, our God. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to study in your word. We ask by the power of the Holy Spirit that you open up our ears, our minds, and our hearts to better receive and understand your word, Father. And that your word prosper in our lives. And that you would get credit for it. We love you and we thank you. In your son's mighty name, amen. All right, so let's go back to... Verse 1 of John chapter 21, which says, Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. To this point, the resurrected Jesus had made at least three specific appearances to his disciples. This would be the fourth appearance in Matthew uh, chapter 28, verses 9 through 10. We learned that uh, we, Peter didn't tell us this, but we get it from Matthew's account that. Jesus told Mary Magdalene when she was at the tomb along with the uh, when she came to the tomb and discovered it empty and she had her encounter with the resurrected Christ. She he, Jesus told Mary and the other women that were with her to tell the other disciples to go to Galilee and he would meet them there. So we now pick up in verse 21. John described that they're in Galilee at this back in Galilee due to the bequest of Jesus through uh, Mary and their he hadn't appeared yet and so we see they're going to go fishing but that's why they're in Galilee because Jesus had communicated to the disciples through Mary to meet him in Galilee all right we're going to take verses two and three together for the sake of continuity of the story and they go as follows several of the disciples were there Simon Peter Thomas nicknamed the twin Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples verse three Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Well, we'll go too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. So prior to being called by Jesus, many of these disciples were fishermen, particularly Peter. a matter of fact, Jesus, when he encountered Peter, say, he, Jesus, Peter was fishing. He said, I'm going to make you a fisherman of men, in which he did. And so after his resurrection, Jesus told these men, again, I said before, to meet him and the region of Galilee. And so that's where they are. Seven of the disciples or in this group include Peter and as the verse indicated that Peter declared that he was going to go to fishing, uh, which is something he was uh, accustomed to doing. So we don't know. We're not told whether or not Peter went fishing out of boredom, out of hunger or to make some money. Because, again, these individuals still had to live and 
fishing was a source of revenue. It was a livelihood. So we're not told that if they going fishing, uh, what was the purpose of going fishing? Was they going to fishing because they were hungry and wanted something to eat? Or had they resumed after the death of Jesus, had they resumed um, their normal normal um, means of income, which is which was fishing? But we see in this verse that they didn't catch any fish. Um, and so the lack of fish serves a useful point here because Jesus had called them to be fisher of men, not going back to their regular lives of being fishermen of fish. And so I think Jesus is going to use that as a point that you didn't catch anything because that's not your destiny. I don't want you to, he didn't want them to go back to their normal lives of fishing. He wanted them to, as we're going to eventually see, to be fishermen of men to preach the gospel of the resurrected Christ, which they did and with they were fishermen of men. All right, we're going to move on to verses four and five. We're going to take them together for the sake of continuity. Verse number four of John chapter 21. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. Verse number five, he called out fellas. And some translations may say children. Some translations may say friends. Have you caught any fish? No, they replied. At sunrise and after un, an unsuccessful night of fishing, the disciples are not likely to recognize Jesus standing far off on the shore of Galilee because they're out in the boat. The sun is just coming up because, again, they've been fishing all night. They were night fishing. And so you have Jesus. Uh, obviously, they were in um, shouting distance or where they weren't too far in the water where they couldn't hear Jesus, but they couldn't see him. So they didn't immediately recognize him from um what we get from these scriptures and jesus asked him you know have you caught anything and again jesus is not asking this question because he wants the information so in other words jesus was not asking because he didn't know whether or not they had caught anything jesus knew they hadn't caught anything but he was communicating with them even though he knew that they hadn't caught anything in his normal sense he's communicating with them and he's communicating with us because jesus know that ultimately john is going to write this letter and put this incident in his letter. And so he's making a record for you and I to read today. Um, and so we, we see that. Verse number 16. Uh, then he said, throw out your net on the right hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because they were so because there were so many fish in it. We learn from Luke's account and particularly chapter five, verses three through seven. We learn that Peter had a similar event with Jesus where he had gone fishing all night and didn't catch anything. And Jesus told him where to put the net and he caught in a haul that he had probably never caught before. And so we see a replication of that in John chapter 21 after the resurrected Christ had come back that these men had been fishing all night and they hadn't caught anything. And Jesus tell them what to do and they catch so many fish that they couldn't initially haul in the net and so we see a repeat of that when we follow instructions from god we see success both time peter following the instructions of god he received success all right verse number seven we're going to take verses seven and eight together for the sake of continuity verse number seven then the disciple then the disciple jesus love said to peter it's the lord when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and headed to shore. Verse number eight. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about a hundred yards from shore. The instant appearance of so many fish makes the identity of the man on the shore obvious to them, specifically to Peter, because it probably came back in his mind the prior incident where Jesus told him where to place his net and, and caught an incredible haul, they recognized that at least Peter, well, we know more than Peter because we just saw when the verse number seven, when it says the disciple that Jesus loved, John is referring to himself. So we saying John said to Peter, it's the Lord. So at that point, they recognized that who it was, it was Jesus that was talking to them and giving them instruction. And Peter reaction is typically of Peter jumps off the boat, and swim to see his Lord and Savior, Jesus, and ultimately the others going to follow in the boat, boat. Verse number nine. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over charcoal fire and some bread. 
So by the time the men arrived to the beach, Jesus had prepared breakfast of fish and bread. Look at our Lord and Savior. Still acting as a servant, even in his resurrected, glorified body. After he's died for their sins, he's still serving them. He's prepared breakfast for them. Let's look at verse number 10 of, out of John chapter 21. Bring some of your fish you just caught, Jesus said. So he said, bring some of your fish and add to the, to the breakfast. And we're going to read verses 11 and 12 together. So Simon Peter would, went, ab went abroad and dragged the net to shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. This is an indication of more miraculous sign, insinuating the fish were larger than normal. And so much so, so they did not break the net. These were 153 large fish. And they didn't break the net. That's another miraculous sign. That detail should not be lost. John put that in saying that specifically for a reason. 100 feet, 153 large fish. And it says, yet the net did not tear. That's another miraculous sign here. The first miracle is that, remember, these are fishermen by trade they've been fishing all night jesus tell them to put the net on one side of the boat and all of a sudden bam 153 large fish got in their net that's a miracle and the fact that these fish given their length their size did not tear the net another miracle all right moving on to verse 12 now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. By serving breakfast, we see Jesus still functioning as a servant as usual. Even in his glorified state, even at all he's gone through, the beating, the death, he's resurrected. The betrayal, the betrayal by the disciples, let's not forget that. The denial of him. They're running and hiding. No one's standing up for him. But he didn't, when he saw them, he didn't bring all that up. Oh, Peter, you denied me. Why did y'all flee? Why didn't nobody pick up for me? Why didn't nobody stick up for me? Why didn't nobody say anything? Why didn't nobody do anything? Jesus didn't say any, any of that stuff. He came in in the room. He said, peace be unto you. And breath on them and the Holy Spirit upon them, giving them eternal life. Here we see them see Jesus acting still as a servant as he did before, before his death, burial, and resurrection. We don't see Jesus chastising them. He's loving them. He's serving them. He's finna get ready. And as we conclude this podcast, these last couple of episodes, he's getting ready to restore Peter who had rejected him or denied him three times publicly as Jesus had predicted. But he didn't blast out Peter, say, why did you, why didn't you speak up for me? Why did you deny me? He's going to give him commission to take care of his sheep because he already told Peter, I'm going to make you a fisherman of men. And, he, and when he told Peter that I'm going to make you a fisherman of men, Jesus knew then that Peter was going to not deny him three times. None of that was a surprise to Jesus. That's, an, that's how great and loving Jesus is, our Lord and Savior. Look at his example. That's who we serve. That's who our Savior is. Moving on to verse number 14. Hold on. I think we left off at verse. Yes, 14. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been risen from the dead. While Jesus has shown himself to others, including the women who came to his tomb, this is the third time he appeared to the group of disciples. And as we see in the next verse, his purpose here is not merely to meet his followers, but to give Peter an important message. Peter is crucial here. Verse number 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Peter, Simon, Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know, I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Only a few days earlier, it may seem like time maybe months years but these all these events keep in mind have happened within days of one another days of one another 
So only a few days earlier, Peter had stood by a fire and had denied even knowing Jesus three times, which we looked at. Now Peter stands by another fire. Hallelujah. And Jesus will make him repeat his loyalties three times. Three times Jesus denied. Three times Peter, excuse me, denied Jesus. And it's three times he's going to reaffirm his loyalty to Jesus. Jesus is going to restore this man. He'll restore you if you come to him. He's in the restoration business. He's restored all of us. Anybody that has accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord of the you had to be restored because we came to him as sinners, low down, dirty sinners. We didn't come in him in our own perfection and righteousness. There's no such thing for a man. We came to him as a sinner, beaten down. And he restored us. He forgave our sins and he restored us. And, he, and believing in him, we became sons and daughters of God, heirs and joint heirs with him, restored, blessed with his peace, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness of sin. He didn't just do that for Peter. He did that for all of us. But we've seen an example starting with Peter. Now, when Jesus questioned Peter about whether or not Peter loved him more than these, it's probably a reference to the other disciples. Because remember, Jesus, excuse me, remember, Peter had said in his reassurance that he had loved Jesus more than any of the other disciples. You can find that in Mark 14, verse 29. And so Jesus, knowing that, saying, do you really love me more than these other disciples? And Peter says, yes. And he said, Jesus said, well, then feed my lamb. And Jesus is referring to as the new converts that Peter is going to be entrusted with. Because again, Jesus know what the great works that he's going to do. Preaching the gospels to mainly Jews, but some non-Jews, Gentiles, as they refer to. He said, feed them. Give them the word of God. Tell them about me, which he's going to do. Let's see it again. Verse 16. Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Now Jesus repeat the question using essentially the exact same ideas. Peter probably understand where this is going. Why Jesus keep asking them. Because again, he denied him three times. Peter denied Jesus three times, and so he's getting this affirmation of his love three times. He's seeing where Jesus is going with this. And when Jesus says sheep here, Jesus is referring to mature believers, because not only is Peter going to be interacting with new converts, but he's going to be dealing with people who, who are older, mature believers in the course of his ministry on this earth. He said, take care of my sheep. And then finally in verse number 17, a third time he asked him, this is Simon, son of John, do you love me? It says Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. If Peter did not understand what Jesus meant by repeating his questions about love, he certainly understands now. Peter understands that Jesus is not asking because he does not know the answer. He is asking to prove a point. The three denials are being countered by three affirmation of loyalty and love for Jesus. Because again, Jesus is not asking Peter this question over and over again because he's really trying to know or understand whether or not Peter loves him. Jesus, as God, knows that Peter loves him. He knows that. He never come back and say, no, nah, Peter, no, you don't. You don't love me. After each time he give Peter instructions, take care of my lamb. Feed my lamb. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. And what, he's, what Jesus is referring to to Peter and all those is that great commission. Tell others about me. 
tell them that I die for their sins. Tell them I was raised with all power over heaven and over earth. That their sins can be forgiven because of what I've done. And he did that and the other disciples did that and Paul did that. And all believers in Jesus Christ are commissioned to do that. And that's a part of what we're doing here. That's a part of what I'm doing. It's to tell others about Jesus Christ. And that's if you are a believer, that's a part of your responsibility as well. We are commissioned to tell others about Jesus that doesn't necessarily mean starting a church. That doesn't necessarily mean going into ministry full time. But there are opportunities in some form, shape, or fashion that God has provided for you to tell others about him. Whether well, there's that financial contribution to missionaries, to ministries, telling someone simply about this podcast and similar podcasts where we're studying the word of God. There are many ways where you could be telling someone about Jesus. The question is, are you, have you, will you? I encourage you to do it. I encourage you to do it. Someone told you about Jesus. None of us who believe in Jesus Christ just woke up, woke up out of bed one morning, have never heard of Jesus and say, I believe in Jesus now. At some point in our lives, through most of, for probably most of us, by in a church setting, but it didn't have to be in a church setting, where we heard the word of God about Jesus and responded to it. Give someone else that opportunity. It does not have to be in a church setting. You can tell someone about Jesus in anywhere. Anywhere. And God has presented that opportunity. To all of us, to witness to someone in our lives at some point in time and to tell them about Jesus. Again, you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to open a church. You don't have to do a podcast. You don't have to do any of those things. But at some, and some of you all know this, that was my opportunity to witness to them about Jesus. And you may have missed it. I know I've missed it plenty of time. But one thing for sure, there's going to be if you live, God is going to present you another opportunity and another opportunity. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. Be guided by the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, what would you have me to say to them? What would you have me to do? Don't try to do it in your flesh. Be led by the Holy Spirit. If you as a believer, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You have the counsel and the direction of the Holy Spirit. Tap into him. Ask him, Holy Spirit, what would you have me to do? How would you have me to do it? Don't rely on your flesh. Don't rely. We don't have any power in our flesh. We don't have enough power in and of ourselves. But we have someone in us and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit that, that can empower us to do the things that he would have us to do. Let's pray. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you've sent the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to recreate our spirit and to dwell in us, to empower us to do those things that you have us to do. And I just would pray that you would give us the strength of the power of the Holy Spirit to, to do your will, to make your will known to us and give us the power to do your will, the courage to do your will, the strength to do your will, because it's not easy. It's not easy, and you know that. That's why you give us, you gave us the Holy Spirit to empower us to do it. We thank you for that. We thank you for your only begotten son, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity to read your word, Father. Help us. We need you. We need you in every way, every shape and form, and every aspect of life, Father. We need you. We need you. We need you. We need you. And thank you that we do. We thank you that you never leave us and never forsake us. That you're there with us until the ends of the earth, as your word says, and beyond. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Until next time, may God bless you. We pray that this Bible study has blessed you. If you have a prayer request, you can email it to renewyourmindm at gmail.com or mail it to P.O. Box 721143, Jackson, Mississippi 39272. Remember, 
You can hear current and past episodes at any time on our website of RenewYourMindMinistries.org or on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Alexa, Audible, and Google Podcasts. We encourage you to tell others about the program and share our website of RenewYourMindMinistries.org. Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. By telling others about the program, you are doing your part to spread the gospel into all the world about our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Until next time, this has been Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God.